Welcome to Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional medicine and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and each episode will dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Whether you're a healthcare professional, a patient navigating your path to wellness, or passionate about health and healing and transforming your own life, this podcast is for you. If you like this video, be sure and hit like, and if you want to hear more, just hit subscribe below. Now, without further ado, today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about EMFs and artificial lighting and how it might be affecting your health. This is a topic I find so many patients have questions about, and many, many patients have no idea what it's doing to our health. So let me introduce our guest. Chris is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner who focuses on coaching clients to implement lifestyle and strategies to improve their health, including helping them identify and remove toxicity in their indoor living and working environments, especially in the areas of air, water, lighting, EMFs, and chemicals. He has a personal health journey with heavy metal toxicity due to mercury amalgam fillings as a young adult with EMF sensitivity affecting his daily life. Chris played an important role in forming safe technology groups, which help the public to connect with EMF experts. All the way from Australia. Welcome, Chris. I'm so glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Jill. It's uh, yeah, a privilege and a pleasure. Yeah, you're you're very well known around the world. So to to have the privilege of being interviewed by you is something quite special for me. So thank you. You are welcome. And so as always, I always want to hear your story. And it's interesting because you're outside for a reason. And I want to talk about your story, your journey, and how you really got to be such an expert. We met through another doctor that um, we did a podcast with and or a training program, I think. And I really, as we were talking, realized what a wealth of knowledge you have been. And a lot of it's through your own story. So do you want to start by just telling us a little bit about your journey and uh, how you started realizing that EMFs and lighting and all these things were having an effect on your own health. Yeah, my, my story goes back to when I was a teenager. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 18 and sort of went down the conventional route, then found more holistic therapies. I had to have major surgery for Crohn's, so it was quite a, a huge, uh, I guess, pivotal moment, um, changing me from my course of direction. I was trained to be a, a teacher And I just went off on another course after that. So it's interesting when you talk about lighting, because in a few decades down the track, I actually became a lighting um, salesperson. So I sold lighting into electrical, um, electrical wholesaling uh, institutions. Then I, as I became a health practitioner, came across the work of Dr. Jack Cruz and learned about light. And so I'm my journey. I've sort of gone back to thinking, When I went back to the UK, why did I get sick so quickly? And I actually got a job um, in a a factory as a shift worker. So I was under fluorescent lighting for 10, 12 hours. I didn't get to bed till like midnight most nights. And then I did that for six months. Then I moved into the British winter and went to uni and didn't get light either when you woke up or I was indoors. So um, yeah, it, it just changed my whole physiology and chemistry. And I think that was a major contributor. Um, can you still hear me? Because can I hear you? Yeah. I, can you hear me? Oh, cool. Yeah, that's great. You're um, sounding great. So as far as like the journey of coming into the lighting and the EMF side, I was a little bit further down the track, like 10 years later when I decided to study FDN, which is functional diagnostic nutrition and um, came across Sandeep and people like yourself and did the whole health coaching thing. But There was, I came across Dr. Jack Cruz in 2017, I think it was. And I was like, how come this light story has not been told in any of the courses that I've had? So I got all the books that he recommended. I deep dive into that. And at the time in my work, I actually worked as an insurance agent as well, all indoor under fluorescent lighting on laptops. And I lost my eye vision uh, quite badly when I was 28 and had prescription glasses for about a decade. And I was, before I came to Jack Cruz's work, I was like, I probably need to go back to the optometrist to get a uh-huh. a, a new script. And, I, you know, I deep dived into Jack's stuff, like just went over three hours, three or four times. And his takeaway was pretty simple. It was like ground in the morning, watch the sunrise and wear blue blocking glasses at night. And I did that. And probably six, eight weeks later, I could, my vision had improved to such a degree that I could read without glasses. I tossed them away. And that was the journey with that. (laughs) That was a light start. That was a start with the lighting. 
And then a year later, the EMF part came around when I went to uh, Melbourne, Victoria for 10 days and all my auto autoimmune symptoms flared up. Um, yeah. I could walk, I could sleep, joint pain. Uh, and then just in this journey, obviously these people, when you're ready, the, the experts sort of come to you. And I was uh, introduced to Cyril Burke who's pretty much a, an expert, worldwide expert consulting on the coal and Nick Penalt. And I had got his number from a friend and I like Zoom with him in the middle of Melbourne going, mate, I'm just so ill, what's happening? So he sent me all the way back to learning about the electrification of the power grid all the way through to today's stuff. So I got a good understanding and a knowledge um, from him. And then working with Dr. Sandip Gupta, uh, he was doing more research into mold and viruses and EMF. And we, we built the EMFs Made Simple course. So there's a bit of probably a bit of gaps in between that we need to fill in, but that's really the journey, which is a crazy one, really. Well, it's so interesting because we talked because I had Crohn's back at 25 and it was interesting. We had that similarity. And I think the big takeaway that I want to dive in today is um, our environment matters so much to our health. And I think a lot of people are kind of obliviously walking around, not realizing that their office building, their high rise in the city or their EMF in their home or their dirty electricity. There's so many different sources of things that affect our cells that we don't see. And so we're like, oh, it can't be that big a deal, right? But the truth is, yeah. this is very science-based. And if anything, I think this is one of those areas that you almost need to be an electrical engineer to really understand sometimes the wavelengths and all that. I, I won't claim to be an expert, but maybe let's talk first about um, what are some of the sources of, of electromagnetic frequency that could be affecting someone's health that they may not know about? kind of give like a basic yeah primer. yeah i think i tried it yeah i'm not electric electrical engineer sorry I, I must have cut out there a no bit. worries um, start with yeah. i'm not an electrical engineer because we can just cut yeah, out yeah I'm, I'm not an electrical engineer but i try and uh dif diffuse it down to the average layman's term so essentially a lot of people i find are uh, concerned about towers 5g things around them and well, rightly so but most of the time they're they're getting polluted by their own devices so i find um Sorry, I, okay. Yeah, well, I heard you right. So my, my mobile, mobile phone, Wi-Fi, tablet, um, generally their own devices are the things that they're getting most exposure to because they're also close to them. So they've got them in the hand, in the pocket. Uh, they're within meters, and generally those devices. If you look at the manufacturer's specifications, the people use them outside of the manufacturer's specifications. Not even supposed to hold it against your ear. It's not tested against the body. So we're creating, um, yeah, that cellular mitochondrial stress. So I try to educate people firstly, if they're going to use phones, how to turn off the antennas on their phone. Yeah. A lot of the time, like they don't realize that the old iPhone, it'll just start to connect automatically and you have to go to your settings to turn it off. Um, and then Wi-Fi, if you can, at least turn it off at night. Um, and then if you're a little bit more sensitive or sick or have like mold illness, I like them the hardwire their internet connection with ethernet cable i want a very clean a cleaner zone um because you can hardwire eth ethernet everything um you can do ipads you can do phones let's talk can real be quickly specific because i think this is so important first of all iphones are phones but iphones are the most common but any sort of phone that you have you're talking go into the setting and uh, from what I learned, if your phone is actually getting less bandwidth, it's going to put out more signals to try to get it, right? So if you're in an area where the yeah. the, the bars for your signal is like one, you're going to have a lot more radiation. So is that the time when yeah. you should turn that off? What What's a real practical step that someone could do with their phone? Like to walk us through that. Where would you go? Sorry, my internet's super choppy. Yeah, that's that's the time you really need to um, not use it as a as a phone. Yeah. Um, text is better. Text is less radiation. It's quicker. It's just a little ping. Um, but yeah, make sure you're, you're making calls where there's full bars, mm -hmm. as much signal as you can. Most of my clients, I get them to set up an old um, home phone yeah. at home, like a, <laughs> like a fixed phone. Right, right. The old fashioned way, which we all used to. <laughs> yeah, the old fashioned way. So that's what I do. But yeah, just making sure you're aware that, uh, and people, look, people are putting their phones in Faraday bags and things like that. I'm, I'm saying, look, don't, or cases i'm like don't cover it don't put it in anything that's going to try it will amplify its signal you know because it's constantly trying to emit to the tower um i had a client who turning sorry turning the phone off so we just had to turn it turn it off power it off 
and then she reported back two or three days later saying she was actually dreaming again so um i don't want devices in the bedroom i want them off and away from you so that's virtually the emf hygiene where things are off at night yes um and the advanced part of that is sometimes i get the client if they're really ill to to turn off the powder their bedroom if they can yeah, we've talked about that where you just have a power switch wired so that you can turn yeah. off. Ideally, sometimes even your own. Exactly. Now you mentioned wired. So, and what I was surprised at is I don't know if you have this in Australia, but we have the Sonos wireless sound system. And because the high fidelity of sound, I found when I did my meter to check for the EMFs, it was so high, higher than anything else in my condo, was the frequency coming from those wireless speakers. So, yeah, was, yeah the speakers. You want to wire those and you want yeah. to wire. you can yeah. wire them or you, you can also ask if you're going to buy them ask to get ones that you can switch the bluetooth off you know yeah then you can wire them up so it's the consumer still has the power in their hands if they ask the right questions um i guess the question was you know what are the what are the main um pollutants so mainly your devices from a from a uh a wireless or a microwave radiation perspective um other things are you know, just the electrical field from wiring and, you know, maybe sitting, if your office has like a meter box, the power box outside, outside yeah. of you, you're getting a magnetic field. So it all just is contextual to, to your, how you have your house set up. But electrical field's interesting because, you know, again, we're all concerned about 5G and high frequency. The lower frequency band, just through electrical fields coming from wiring, I mean, 50 hertz, there's PubMed studies showing 50 hertz can reactivate Epstein-Barr. Like, wow. It's crazy. 50, you, you guys have 60 hertz, I think. Is it 60 yeah. hertz or 50 hertz? You got 60 at 110. We've got um, 50 hertz at 240 here in Australia. But uh, we find, you know, when people do that cutoff switch and can sleep without power, it's it's like going back to the earth, you know, it's like. It is. So I always find a clue is asking them if you go out camping or you're sleeping on the ground, do you sleep better? How do you feel? Um, that feels to me like always because they're outside the house, they're in nature and they're or if they're walking barefoot somewhere, often people are feeling better when they're on vacation, but they're just outdoors walking barefoot on the beach away from Wi Fi. And it really, yeah. really does. Would you say sleep is the biggest thing you see as far as effect? Um, what What's some of the biggest symptoms? Yeah. You I mean, sleep also like brain fog and just the ability to think straight you gotta remember like it's good you mentioned that grounding because that grounding is i think 7.83 hertz yeah. we work on a very low low frequency and for example comparatively like the the 2.5 gigahertz on the router is 25 billion hertz a second comparative to your brain waves which are like six to ten hertz you're gonna have some so, and i guess from a like a quantum aspect or just electrical aspect it's so it's negatively sorry it's positively charged electrons right like it's adding positive charge to your electrons where we want we want to be harvesting negative charge which is the grounding mm -hmm. beach yes. water like in the in the sun in the in the ocean and that's why you feel so good because you're, yes. you're negatively charging your cells as opposed to having all this positive charge from electromagnetics and indoor living it's pretty it's it's like simple as that you're like a harvesting electrons for your cells to create you know energy so that's that's probably a, a good a good thing to do like try and trade off your modern lifestyle with outdoor stuff hey everybody i just stopped by to let you know that my new book unexpected finding resilience through functional medicine science and faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books in this book i share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com there you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Well, I think that's yeah, that's work. actually for me, like my biggest recharge is being in nature, barefoot somewhere possible. If I can't, I find my PEMF mat with negative ionic 
can be a, it's not perfect, but it's a little bit of a substitute that really definitely, and I literally use that seven or eight Hertz, which is the same Schumann frequency as the earth, as you mentioned. So really nice. like that. Yeah, that's an in, interesting topic to bring up with grounding. People often get a lot of inquiry about grounding, grounding sheets. Yeah. Can I earth, what, just plug in an earthing mat? It all depends on what your electrical system set up in your country. In Australia, the actual earth is combined with the neutral. So people aren't getting like true earth. Uh -huh. and, and and people, some people go, oh, I slept amazing. And some people go, like, my heart was palpitating. You know, I couldn't sleep. I was awake for three hours. So I just try and say, hey, to ground truly, you go away from the electrical environment, you know, get out into nature, do it properly. Also, it's interesting that if you're on a ground, I had a client who was on a grounding sheet for many years. And she said, funnily enough, when she went to sleep out in nature, she couldn't sleep. Ah, uh, because she's so, so used to it. The body is so used to the it'll pick up the electromagnetic frequency around you trying to adapt to that um so it does take um a couple of weeks it can take a couple of weeks to adapt to you know when you cut that switch off you know trying to get back into rhythm yeah i find it's funny because um the silence the, the when you're either in nature or everything is completely cut off I actually am like, oh, it's so quiet, right? Which is actually our natural state. But it's sometimes to me, it's so quiet. I'm like, oh, this is strange. And I've had yeah. you know, clients and patients tell me they go camping. And for that first night, it's like so different. Um, so it's yeah. interesting because our bodies do have to adjust. So the grounding, I want to talk just a little bit about that because there's a lot of people selling stuff out there, the grounding sheets and grounding mats. And what you're saying is in some places, if your electrical system actually has a true ground, it can be helpful, but it's possible yeah. that could be harmful if you're plugging yes. the wrong thing, right? Yeah. It, um, when I started to research, uh, when I met Sarah Lee pointed me towards David Stetzer's work. David Stetzer is an electrical engineer. Um, he has a lot to say about the grounding and he was doing a podcast with a um, quite a podcaster a lady who was in the health space and she was about to sign this big contract to promote these grounding sheets and she said i was on it for two weeks and i felt like i was on crack like it was just it had me wired um so just be careful you know test it out on yourself and yeah i'm not against i'm not i'm not one who says oh don't do that don't do yeah. that just just test it see how see how you go and then see how it compares to like true grounding and being outside so I, I think that's a big doing those nature things and, and scheduling all those things in are, is important to offset any of the um, electromagnetic um, you know exposures you're getting during the day which of course you have to work some people work in an office right some people yeah so he cut out um, yeah so just make sure you do the trade-off yeah Perfect. Um, so let's talk about artificial lighting. Um, how is that? What kind of, what would we look for? What do we, if we choose for our home, what kind of lighting are we going to want to choose? Tell us a little, cause I don't even myself know what's the best. I know fluorescent obviously is not helpful, but what are the best and worst forms of lighting in a home or office? Yeah. Again, this comes back to, you know, when we turned the, uh, the power grid on and, uh, we start to, you know, light our homes up. And I, I guess using you guys in the States, I think you guys can still get incandescent and halogen. Yeah. And that's a good, really good option because when you test that with, I have a spectrometer, so I test yeah. the visible spectrum, that's predominantly red. And obviously you get heat and near infrared from the incandescent. So if you've already got those, I'd say stock up on those. Um, a lot of building codes are changing around the world where if you're building a new building or a new house, they, they mandate the LED. Uh, Generally, if you have an LED, it usually comes in a really cool mode and then a, a, a warm white mode. Both of them are way too high in blue and green light and not enough of the red part of the spectrum, really. And essentially, like EMFs, you know, again, I learned this from Jack Cruz when he was talking about blue light, but the, the mafia knew how to use blue light in their casinos, right? So they blacked out all the windows, they had the light, so you could sort of, uh, make sure like they can control your dopamine with alcohol. <laughs> it's been used quite a bit um, in the decades to actually uh, change our behavior. And I think there's research showing that if you stay on your laptop and computers after 1030, the spike in sales of things, you buying things is quite high because wow. it's controlling that dopamine. Um, so yeah, that so the lighting is very important. I work with a company in New Zealand who does distribute worldwide that has Sorry, you're going to do some cuts on this. That's okay, but no worries. It's, it's reverse It's reverse engineered. So um, we've changed the spectrum of the light 
So it's a nice daytime spectrum, an afternoon spectrum, and a, and a, a nighttime one that's trying to replicate what's happening outside. And then also the driver is a DC powered driver. So it, it doesn't flicker. A lot of these lighting lighting systems, because you plugged into the mains power, they're, they're, they're pulsing on and off. And that's what's causing fatigue, eye strain, headaches. And I believe long-term neurodegeneration is caused, can be caused in this cycle because one, the lighting at night, especially blue and green lights, depleting your melatonin or your mm. body will hold off um, using melatonin. And then if you can't get enough melatonin into the system, the brain won't detox. So it's this vicious circle, right? Of If your brain can't detox, you know, for 15, 20 years, you're high, probably a high case for a neurodegenerative disease down the track. And it's all based to light and melatonin. And then you need to get your sunshine in the morning because that builds melatonin. So there's these two critical times, which is really sunrise and then nighttime. And what we've done in our modern life is we've, we've brought daytime into nighttime. And, and then like your, your two systems, melatonin and cortisol are confused. So become cortisol dominant and your melatonin sinks and you're not sleeping well from that point on. Yeah, I found that's one of the most important things for people with insomnia is that we, they think of it as what do I take at night? What do I do at night? And yes, you want to block the blue light. You want to use red if possible. You want to not get that into your pupils and your retina basically. But I feel like one of the more important things is what you mentioned earlier, which is that sunlight into your eyes in the morning. I happen to have a chair in my other room that literally sits in front of a window and the sun exactly at least for eight months of the year comes directly in and i love sitting in that chair in the morning and have the sunrise literally you know um come up and go into my retina if i don't are you in a, you in a patio or you in you got the window open the window open it's just oh yeah, it's, cool. yeah exactly so a lot of people a lot of people go you know you gotta remember that window glass does filter out you know the uv so uh, you gotta have window open you gotta you know Interesting. No, I have my window closed. It's, so it's just the, so you're right. The UV, I do have a full spectrum light as well that I oh, use. Oh, that's good. And maybe uh, UV, the UV is not as obviously as powerful if you're in winter, you know, you're not that's so, yeah, true. having maybe some sort of yeah. indoor UV spurty mm -hmm. lamp and, and a full yeah. spectrum one. <laughs> but really I do good. find for patients with sleep issues, that's so powerful is that morning. Cause again, that if you get the morning, your mind is going to be much more circadian rhythm. Um, oh, the circadian but, rhythm really with sunrises is quite powerful if you can get people into the habit of getting up in australia you know i i was doing it recently and then because of the switching into summer it was like 4 30 a.m right getting up it was like it totally screwed me around but we, just to mention that with the sleep we had a client who hadn't slept undrugged for 25 years wow and she used blue blocking glasses and red light and she was sleeping within three days fascinating oh that's so so important now i've found just personally and this is blue light obviously if i need focus and concentration not right before bed i'll turn up the brightness on my screen and it is better than any caffeine because that blue light is create made for creating dopamine and i actually use it and harness it when i need to be productive during the day um not so much before bed though <laughs> that's interesting that it's very interesting we've got to use light to our advantage mm -hmm. um, when when we can. When I do test the screen, um, generally all backlit LED has a predominant blue, like a quite a significant mm -hmm. blue in in the wavelength that is damaging. So it does give you that um, that spike. So yeah. I still like my clients to wear um, other blue, blue blocking filtering glasses when they're indoors during the day to filter down that spike. So you still get enough blue in to keep you awake and, and you keep ticking over, but just not, as damaging as it would be with the got it yeah that makes sense that is now i will say one very interesting thing i don't have all the answers here but um i see an opt optometrist that does filters for glasses like the ones i'm wearing actually have a um, green filter to filter out red because for me my brain works better when it's filtering those lights and when I did the yellow filter to filter out the blue light, I actually, it kind of turned my brain down. So I do yeah, think there's some variation in genetics with That's the right. colors, but True. truth is blue light is very damaging, very harmful, especially if you're having sleep issues because it's an activating um, energy. But I was surprised because I thought blue blockers are for everybody. And I found just personally, I didn't do well with blue blockers. I just avoid that light at night, but I don't yeah. really. Okay. Yeah, I get that. I, it's interesting. I think there's actually something to do with um, 
uh, color, uh, yeah. sorry, a pigment yeah. um, in eyes. So if you if you have blue eyes, you're very can be more damaging to you than than, than brown. And obviously, melanin is a big story. Um, the more you know, melanin you have in this, maybe we can. I don't know where you want to go, but um, mm. with that, but the melanin story is really important, and I think it's a missing piece in detox too. Because again, I learned. Yeah, sorry, melanin is uh, you know, your skin will tan. You know, uh -huh. it's a natural sunscreen. We know that, but you have melanin everywhere. Melanin's in the brain. Melanin is in your heart, um, and the body will suck that melanin in that you've built to to detoxify chemicals and metals. And there was a, I think the Smithsonian Institute did a, an article on pigeons in mm -hmm. polluted cities, and they've got more melanin in their feathers. Mm -hmm. uh, to pro they've adapted to process this out. That's so they can live in really polluted cities, right? Oh, a fascinating. Yeah, because it is a protective against like, um, again, it's even an exposure, yeah. right? It's like an antioxidant, like mm -hmm. it'll work as an antioxidant. So getting this, even like, even if you've got like Fitzpatrick to Irish skin, yeah. you can still build your solar, you know, the solar yield. And like you said, the morning UVA to UVB, UVA in the morning bef before the UVB kicking in is really important to um, build the skin's ability to take on the UVB. So oh, that's fascinating. So very would, critical. The timing is so critical of the time. So would you say if you are um, wanting to get a little sun exposure carefully, would you go morning or first before you go afternoon? One hundred percent. You'd start with the sunrise. It's got no UV in it. You're going to get massive amounts of red in IR for like yeah infrared all these hormones. <laughs> yeah. And then I think there's a I don't you'll have to check it out on the internet. There's an app called D-Minder, I think that works out when everything kicks in. I know in Australia, it's between 8 and 10 a.m. at the moment that you get the UVA wow. and then the UVB kicks in. For like oh, fascinating. Hours. That's so, I did not know that. Now, I want to shift a little because you had a story of mercury toxicity in metals. How does that play into sensitivity to EMFs? And then also right. um, any advice on how we can minimize exposure to some of those things in our environment? Yeah, the, the mercury fillings things, I'm an 80s child, so they just used to, you know, if you had yeah. a tiny little cavity, yeah. used to drill the whole thing out and um, ended up with like eight fillings by the time I was 10 years old, at silver mercury filling. And I really think that, yeah, that toxicity drove a lot of the autoimmune stuff that came a little bit later. I, I got my fillings out by a holistic dentist, but again, that's also by individual because too quick and you can reactivate mercury and right. start to dump it out which in my case i think happened as well um so but learning about emf and toxicity and and elect especially electrosensitivity i was watching dr neil nathan he's quite a prominent um toxicity doctor 50 years in practice he just did something with nick penalt about um emf electrosensitivity he's seeing epidemics of it in um, california where he practices and I really do believe if you look at the research and go into the, the, the research and the literature, uh, chemically sensitive and um, people become electrosensitive. So metals and chemicals, all those synergies in the body, if you haven't detoxed those out, you become electrosensitive. That's exactly right. It's like toxic load, right? And metals, toxic of course, load. I've actually, I'm sure you've had some uh, clients that maybe talked about this, but copper, for example, can be incredibly high as far as, uh, or an issue if it's high in someone, if someone has Wilson's disease or some of these diseases 100%. with yeah, high copper, copper is very conductive, right? And some of my 100%. most sensitive EMF patients have very high copper levels yeah. and we have to address that. They literally- That become... was me. Oh, really? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, I had oxide pyrroles. Yeah. And I tr Sandeep was working with Sandeep with that. And then I've done HTMA and HTMA last year was super high and copper was super high off the chart. And I actually got to a point where I couldn't go to a house yes. that had Wi-Fi on. Yeah. My head is just like a zen, yeah. right? So I did some more more tailored um, detox protocols, which were mineral rebalancing in nature. So not the, the heavy zeolites or anything yeah. binders, nothing like that. Just just re rebuild the body through the mineral balancing. And my follow-up HGMA was, I don't know, X times, 50 times lower. Yeah. And I, I felt it. I literally felt it. And um, that I believe that those who are electrosensitive can yes. do that. And once they get the chemicals and the, and the heavy metals reduced, they become more tolerant. Again, I don't, <clears throat> there's 
there's a caveat to this, right? Because people think that when they feel better, they just use it any time they want. Right. I can use this for 10 hours, you know, and you get back to, a, you get a whole host of different issues coming up. But that's probably, yeah, the detox and of those things and the heavy metals was key for me to become less sensitive for sure. Yeah, I love that you're saying that because what I do find is there's definitely genetically and uh, chemically people who are way more sensitive to EMF. I'd say maybe 20% of my patient population has yeah. severe sensitivity and the other 80% don't really know. The truth is we all are sensitive, right? So the more that we can reduce exposure because we know it's radiation damage to the cells and literally it's it's an, it's an a trigger for DNA damage and all kinds of other things. So all of yeah. us are susceptible. It's just some of us are way yeah. more sensitive and notice um, and interesting, you mentioned the copper. I've had a patient uh, before who literally like would walk into a building with EMF and turn red with a rash, like very clearly yeah. would start reacting. Yeah. It just amazing. like you mentioned. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think um, it's interesting when you get the client better detox and then start doing the EMF hygiene stuff as well, but keep, get that as a lifestyle thing and get the, the lighting as a lifestyle thing. They change their, their whole environment they actually still are become sensitive but i think it's it's a good sensitivity yes. because their body is now more aware it's not now it's not the the frog in the pot getting yeah cooked at a low range and then you've got some terrible hideous disease it's just it knows where the danger is yeah <laughs> yeah you feel you better know? and usually what it is is someone's sick they're not well and all of a sudden they get to a state of pretty good health they're sleeping great they got have good energy their brain is clear and i'm that way too i notice when i'm not performing because i know this is the level i want to perform and if something's taking me down i notice it pretty quickly because i want to stay at this level i want my patients to stay at that level of high performing and feeling great and good energy and good sleep so um yeah, 100%. so yeah. um in our, in our last little bit here, first of all, I'd love to just go through, what do you take someone through as far as like the checklist? We said phones, like maybe just take us through what are the top five or six or eight things that patients would want to just think about um, with their home environment? Start there. Yeah, I think, you know, it's contextual too. Like I always get them to book in with me to go, hey, what is really going on? Because who knows, they probably have mold. They could have mold. They could have like, you know, don't know where the heck their water's coming from. And we're filtering a tank water without UV and filtering on it. So it's like the whole checklist can be quite long. So right. I do I do like a free 30 minute. But if we're talking about EMF, you know, phones, uh, phones off at night, Wi-Fi off at night, um, get into your settings of your phone to turn off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth and the location services when you don't need them. These all can be turned back on because it's so important, Jill, because the phones... The phones are tested for microwave effects on humans in 97 with a little 2G phone with one antenna. And after six minutes on that phone, you start to get the microwave heating effect, right? Yeah. So you get starting to get microwaved like your chicken in the, in uh -huh. the microwave. Whereas we know the DNA effects and the, the biological effects happen way before the cooking effect. So I'm saying you had that happened after six minutes with one antenna. You've got five antennas on this thing. Another four on your iPad. Yeah. So just get them to turn them down and use which ones they need when required. So that's that's a very simple hack. We just get used to using their phone. Um, wi fi is off at night. Um, one thing we haven't spoke about is, I don't know how big this is in Australia, but dirty electricity is huge in Australia because they're, sorry, your editing guy's going to be busy. Um yeah. Dirty electricity. Do you, I don't know if you guys have a lot of solar in the US, but yeah. um, the inverters that ch uh, switch the DC to AC power um, cause a lot of harmonic changes on the wiring. And that can be very, uh, actually quite nauseous in a, in a building. It can be very sick, headaches, fatigue. Um, so we like to, I like to, when I go to, I, I test dirty power first and foremost. Yeah. Um, again, you probably have to engage someone who's a professional to do that, but and then also get the electrician to quote you getting the cutoff switch for the bedrooms. I mean, get the power off. Perfect. You know, um, that's that's usually probably the top three or four. If you want to go further, you know, there's paint. You can you can paint shield your bedrooms. You know, some of our clients sleep in Faraday cages. But again, that's that's really down the line. Oh, yeah. So um, that's a great when, thing. There's some really basic things, and and really part of it is get to know the settings on your phone. 
right? Yeah. And I will put a plug because you guys have this EMF made simple course. We'll be sure and link up to that. If you're listening to this podcast and you want to know, what do I do? You guys have yeah. done a great online course. So that's a great place to start. If you really want to dive yeah. deep you and Dr. Uh, Gupta. Um, so we'll yeah. be sure. And that's link. right. We're, and we, we want people to get educated because we, mm -hmm. we don't want people just have to come back and ask the same questions. Once you're educated, you know, and you'll always know. So then you can take, you can take it to the next yeah. level if you, if you want to. So I, I'm big. I'm big about. I think. I, yeah, I was trained to be a teacher, so I think in the heart of me is all about getting awareness and education is always first, and then you can choose which things you would like to do. You know. Yeah. No, I love that, and it doesn't. Again, it doesn't have to be you sleep in a cave. I mean, this can be actually really <laughs> some very practical things that aren't super difficult, and you can yeah. start with some. So I love that. That yeah. makes it very accessible. And you can and and you can get blue blocking glasses. They're fairly cheap. Yes. Um, yeah, you, you know, you can get a couple of red light bulbs and have them on up. And half an hour before we go to bed, it's amazing. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Um, the last thing I always like to ask is, um, you have this quite this journey, and it's probably a blessing in disguise because it taught you and got you to where you're at now, which is amazing as a teacher, maybe not how you expected. But if you could go back to your younger self and either tell yourself something or make one change, what would you do or mm. wish you would have known um, before you got sick with all of this? Yeah, definitely. It's really interesting because when just going back to the UK after high school is what was the trigger and just the whole environment change was when I lived here as a kid, I was already surfing. I was already getting up with the sunrise. Yeah. I was already going to bed early, you know? So I think just when I moved, it, it changed a lot. I, I wouldn't have, you know, don't get the shift working job, you know, go gardening or something, you know? Like keep outside in nature. Make sure you're balancing that uh that technical use with with nature. And back then there wasn't a lot of tech to tell you the truth. We never had Wi-Fi. We never even had phones. You know, it was uh more shift work and getting out of out of sync. So maybe just more nature. You know, continue that 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 journey on with the nature and 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 not go to a European country that's totally out of sync with the sun and has no UV light like right. nine months of the year. Right. Right. No, totally get it. Like way up in the, like Alaska or some of these Northern places too, same way for us in the U S. Um, yeah. well, thank you for taking your difficulties and your suffering and your illness and transforming it into a way to really help people. Um, grateful for your, uh, efforts and your education as a teacher, you still are, you're a teacher. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. I appreciate you and everything you do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks again for coming on.